أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the compassionate, the merciful, the one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon His pure and beloved Messenger, the peak of His creation, the symbol of humanity, our beloved Prophet, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And his immaculate and pure progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al Imam Al Mahdi, Ajjarallahu Ta'ala Faraja. May God hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْعَالِمِينَ صدق الله العلي العظيم Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The costliest war in the history of humankind was World War II. When you consider the cost of this war only in the United States, it's equivalent to four trillion dollars, let alone the cost in Europe and in other parts of the world. World War II was also the deadliest war in the history of humankind. Some 45 to 80 million people were killed in this war. And by the way, this was a war which had nothing to do with the religion of Islam or Muslims. A war that involved Western countries. Now there were many factors which led to World War II. It wasn't a single factor. But one of the most important factors was a single man by the name of who? Adolf Hitler. This man played a very important role in sparking this war which killed 40 to 80 million people. Now, when you examine Germany at the time, the Germans were 70 million. It's really puzzling. Okay, so Adolf Hitler, he was out of his mind. He was a dictator. He was insane. But how did he convince a nation of 70 million people to go to war with the entire world? To commit the most heinous crimes? to kill innocent people. How did he do that? Because the Germans, just like any other nation, most of them were rational people. They weren't crazy people. How did he make them crazy? How did he convince them to go to war with the entire world? He himself, in, in one of his books, the name of his book is Mein Kampf, which means my struggle. He actually writes down the ways through which he mobilized his nation. He made them into extremists and he convinced them to go to war with the entire world. He lists them. Let's go through some of them. They're very interesting. For example, one of the things that he mentions in his book, he says, when a speaker like me is speaking to crowds, when a president is speaking, when any ruler is speaking, he should keep the dogma very simple. Just use one or two points. Keep it very simple and straightforward. What does that remind you of? Lines like what? Ban all Muslims, right? Does this ring a bell? Or for example, declaring that, you know, in order for us to solve the issue of immigrants, let's just build a big beautiful wall. Right? How many times have you heard this in recent days? 
Hitler says, keep it very simple, just one or two lines. And then he also says, reduce very complex concepts down to stereotypes. Make everything as if it's black or white. And what did we hear the past few months? All those Mexican immigrants, they're criminals, they're rapists, they're this, they're that. Reducing very complex ideas to something that's black and white. And then one of the points that he mentions, play with people's emotions, stir their fear, stir their anger. Another point that he mentions is that repeat what you say, use repetition. Keep repeating your points over and over and over because that's how you create zealots. That's how you can rally your crowd. Another thing that he mentions is that you should speak with authority, full authority, full power, as if you could destroy the whole world. You could teach the whole world a lesson. And when you speak to people, speak in the telling mode, in the ordering mode. Speak with authority as if you're giving people orders. And this is very dangerous, we'll see why. And so on and so forth. He lists a few points on how to radicalize a nation. How to convince them to go to war with the entire world. And he did succeed in that. Now this is one thing that he used. The second thing was authority. When you speak with authority to a nation and you tell them what to do, this becomes extremely dangerous. Why? Because there's something about the human psychology. We human beings, we tend to submit to authority, whether it's good authority or bad authority. This is extremely dangerous. In the 1960s, an interesting experiment was conducted. Milgram's experiment. Some of you may have read about it. Basically, they had ordinary people, ordinary citizens, come to a lab. And a science professor, a scientist would tell them, look, we're doing this experiment and there's someone sitting in a room. And there's a cable, an electric cable attached to that person. We want you to shock that person administer an electric shock to that person. Initially, the people hesitated, you know, will this hurt that person? The scientist said, no, you have to do it. I'm a scientist, I'm telling you to do this. You know that most of those people in that lab, they were willing to administer a fatal shock because they would increase the voltage. It was all a game, of course. No one was being electrocuted to death. But those participants thought that they were electrocuting that person. Most of them were willing to go that far, to actually kill someone. Now later when they asked them, how did you bring yourself to do that? It boiled down to one thing, authority. While a professor was telling me to do it. A scientist was telling me to do it. And scientists command some authority. This is extremely dangerous. When someone comes with the wrong rhetoric, with a dangerous rhetoric and speaks with authority, an entire nation can be radicalized, just like Hitler did with 70 million Germans. That's why in the religion of Islam, Muslims are encouraged by the Holy Quran, by the teachings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, not to blindly accept any authority. Isn't this exactly the message of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? Don't just accept the authority because it's an authority figure. No, you have to see, is this a good authority or a bad authority? The Muslims at the time, at the time of Bani Umayyah, they were fooled by the Bani Umayyah because they forged so many narrations attributing them to the Prophet that you have to obey the Khalifa even if he is corrupt, even if he is an oppressor, you have to obey him because he's Someone who has authority, someone who has power. But the message of Imam al Hussein salam was no. If I have a ruler who's unjust, who has no regard for the laws of God, don't respect that authority. You have to sacrifice. And he's the one who showed us how to sacrifice. 
Now, let me make this very clear. This is in no comparison what I mentioned about Hitler and how he radicalized 70 million Germans. This is in no way a comparison between Hitler and Donald Trump. Hitler was a mass murderer. He was the most evil dictator of his time. Donald Trump, you know, let's just say he's a genius who lost $916 million in 1995. This is not a comparison between the two. But why is this alarming? Why is this alarming to us? Because this tells us that if you have poisonous rhetoric, even if you have a peace-loving nation, even if you have a nation that respects others, you will radicalize this nation. Because poisonous rhetoric, if you keep hearing it for a month, two months, five months, for an entire year, and someone who claims to have authority, someone who could potentially be a president, this is very dangerous. It ruins the social fabric of our society, the religious fabric, the racial fabric. This is why it's very alarming. And the past year or so, we have seen the most hateful rhetoric from someone like Donald Trump about immigrants, about African Americans, and especially about Muslims and the religion of Islam. You know, Donald Trump, he's not really an Islamophobe. If you look at his history, you don't find anything significant in his history about, against the religion of Islam. Donald Trump is an opportunist. He's using this hateful rhetoric in order to solicit more voters, in order to create zealots, to have the highest number of Americans supporting him. That's what it's about. Otherwise, if you look at his history, he doesn't really care about the religion of Islam. He really doesn't care about Muslims. But once he realized that if you stir hate and anger, then there are people who will be impacted by this fear. And they'll vote for you. They'll give you their support. And this is extremely dangerous. That's why he uses these tactics. He knows what he's doing. Donald Trump uses tactics primarily to cater to two types of groups. You know the tactics that he used, he creates this enemy, Muslims, immigrants. He focuses on humiliation. We Americans are being humiliated by these terrorists, by China, by Japan, by whoever it is, by Mexico. And you know what? This actually has an impact on many Americans. They feel humiliated when they hear such rhetoric. So he creates anger, he creates fear, he creates this feeling of humiliation. And this pushes so many people. So he's trying to cater to two groups. The first one is traditional white Christian males. He wants their support. And he's tapping into their deeply rooted racial and religious bias. Because he wants their support. You know, since the 1960s, this group of people, they lost a lot of their prestige, a lot of their power. And they're not happy with that. They miss those good old days when they could openly boast about being the best of the people, about degrading others, openly attacking other races. Some of them miss those days. And so he's trying to gain support in this particular group. So he uses this rhetoric in order to arouse them. This is one group. The second group which is very dangerous is white supremacists. You know, groups like the KKK and others. He's trying to mobilize them. And you know, since decades, he's given them the biggest boost in membership. The biggest boost in membership. Every single day, they're recruiting thousands of people because of this hateful rhetoric because of what he's doing to this society. They're gaining more and more members, and they love what he's doing, especially when he speaks with authority, and he wants to teach the whole world a lesson, and all races, he wants to teach them a lesson, they love that. You know, the Pharaoh used the same techniques. He spoke with so much authority, so much power, 
Ana Rabbukum al-A'la. I'm even your Lord. That's what he declared. And the Egyptians, they just submitted to that power. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns everyone in the Holy Quran. Tilka dar al Allah says that dar al the afterlife is for who? It's for who? Lilladheena la yuriduna uluwan fil ardi wa la fasada. It's for those who do not want to be arrogant in this life and act so powerful. Allah has assigned the akhirah for those who do work. They may rise to power, but with humbleness. Their goal is not just to achieve power. So we see that he is using fear and anger and hatred in order to gain support from these two groups. And this is very alarming because he's really creating hate and fear. You know, back in March, there was an interview conducted with him. And you know what he said? Many of you may remember this. He said, I believe that Islam hates us. You know what this does when millions of Americans hear this from someone who has some sort of authority because he's a candidate? He said, I believe that Islam hates us. Now I have to say something here. What do you mean, Mr. Trump, by us? If by us you mean racism, then yes, you're right. Islam hates racism. If by that you mean sexism, then yes, Islam is, is, is against that. If by us you mean when you mocked that disabled person, that reporter with a disability, then yes, Islam hates that. If by that you mean hatred and racism and egotism, then yes, Islam hates that. But you see the fear that he's creating. Many people are really afraid of the religion of Islam when they hear such hateful rhetoric. And they have no clue what Islam is, what extremism is, what Muslims are. Just like the Sharia issue that we had a few years ago, remember? When everyone was talking about Sharia Allah creeping into our societies like this spider in our societies. Many of you heard that, right? But most of those people who were pushing for anti-Sharia legislation, they had no clue what Sharia Allah is. I remember one, one time this state senator from Alabama, he was pushing for anti-Sharia legislation. And you know, he was very fervent about it. A reporter asked him, can you explain to us what Sharia is? You know what he said? He's like, I don't have my file in front of me right now. Has no clue. Has no clue what Sharia is, yet he's pushing, he's pushing for anti-Sharia legislation. You know, many of you may remember the interview with my respected father and Pastor Terry Jones. When my father asked him, why did you come here to burn the Qur'an? What brought you here? What did he say? He said, I have come to protest Sharia. Sharia is no good. I burned the Qur'an to show my rejection of Sharia. My father asked him, what is it about Sharia that you don't like? What is it about it? He's like, Sharia is very violent. My father asked him, give me an example. What is it about Sharia that you don't like? Remember what he said? He's like, yeah, because I burned the Qur'an, because the Sharia and the Qur'an tells Muslims to stone the one who has committed adultery. My father told him, you know, if that's why you burned the Qur'an, that's not mentioned in the Qur'an. It's mentioned in the Bible. The Bible is actually the book that speaks of stoning the adulterer. And 16 others, by the way. The Bible prescribes stoning to death or the capital punishment to 16 offenders. One of them is a rebellious child. Thank God you're not living in that era because we have some rebellious kids in our communities. But the Bible does speak about that, by the way. A rebellious son who doesn't stop his rebellion is to be stoned to death at the gates of the city so everyone can see it. That's the Bible. Many of them are ignorant. What's going on? What is the religion of Islam? They have no clue. But it's this fear that he's creating and he's actually lying to many Americans. What's amazing to me is that I've never seen this anywhere, really. 
Someone who can openly come out and lie to millions of people and just get away with it. And people are cool about that. This is extremely dangerous. You know, he claimed to see thousands of Muslims celebrating on 9-11 when those twin towers came down in New Jersey. And when they kept asking him, you know, there's no such thing, there's no such footage. He kept insisting, no, I saw it with my own eyes. I saw thousands of these Muslims celebrating that day. But you know what? Millions of Americans are actually buying these lies. And it's really impacting them. Now, let's look at these statistics. Because one of the points that he is using, and those Islamophobes are using, is that the biggest threat today to American society is what? Muslim terrorism, or they call, it, they call it Islamic terrorism. We don't have Islamic terrorism. Yes, there are so-called Muslims who commit acts of terror. But we don't have something called Islamic terrorism. The religion of Islam is a peaceful religion. If you remember the Republican primaries and the debates, it seemed as if the biggest threat to America was Islamic terrorism. These Muslims, they're destroying our society. They're going to kill all of us. And many Americans are actually believing that. That the biggest threat facing their society today is Muslim extremism. But let's look at the facts. I want you to know these facts so you can share these facts with your society. And this is not to downplay extremism and terrorism committed by so-called Muslims. Terrorism is a grave sin. It's a grave crime. But is it really the biggest threat that we're facing in our society? Look at these statistics. Here in the United States, from 2005 till 2010, how many Americans in the U.S. were killed by Muslim terrorists? How many do you think? The way Trump talks about it, you would think 240,000, right? The way he's presenting it to the people, because that's the biggest threat. How many, according to official statistics, from 2005 till early 2015, 24 Americans died? 24. And yes, this is a huge crime. Because every life is sacred. But is this really the biggest threat facing America? In a decade, 24 Americans dying because of extremist Muslims who committed acts of terrorism? In this same period, brothers and sisters, in this same decade, over 300,000 Americans were killed because of gun violence. You know, even the Washington Post reported that in the year 2013, there were more Americans killed by toddlers, little kids with guns, than by Muslim extremists and terrorists. You're more likely to be struck by lightning and killed by your TV set or your couch than to be killed by a Muslim extremist or terrorist. But is that how our politicians talk about it? Some of them. They make it to you as if it's the biggest threat facing our society. But Americans really don't know these facts. Ask a random American tomorrow if you see. How many people do you think have been killed? They really think it's in the thousands, hundreds of thousands. They have no clue. We need to share these statistics. In 2015, there were 355 mass shootings in the U.S. 355 mass shootings. And yes, one of them was an extremist. You know, that terrorist Farooq, the one who was responsible for the San Bernardino attacks. But what does Trump do? He takes this one particular shooting and he makes it the biggest threat facing America. If you look at Europe, because Europe saw a wave of attacks as well. The last several years, if you look at Europe, the last 10 years or so, the last 15 years or so, out of all acts of terrorism committed in Europe, 2% of them was what? by Muslims, even less than their population. Because if you examine the population of Muslims in Europe, in some countries it's 5%, in some 10%, in some 15%. But only 2% of all terrorist acts were committed by Muslims in Europe. Is this really the biggest threat? 
But many people don't know that. We have to share these statistics with our society to calm them down a bit. Yes, terrorism is a big issue. We have to solve terrorism. We have to denounce terrorism. But, Lord, but don't let that fear make you irrational. Don't make that fear make you a racist person. So the results have been very damaging. The results of such poisonous rhetoric, the results, the consequences of such hateful rhetoric has been very, very damaging. You know, there was a blog, a hate blog, for people who wanted to express their hate. It had 11,000 members. After the rhetoric of Trump, you know how many members now it has? 11 million. 11 million people now are subscribed to this hate blog. What does that tell you? This is very dangerous. And to show you about the religion of Islam specifically, what's happening in this country, according to some surveys that were done recently, the religion of Islam is seen as the most unfavorable religion in this country, behind atheism. Can you imagine that? In June, this past June, just uh, two, three months ago, nearly half of Americans supported Donald Trump's proposal to ban all Muslims. Nearly half of Americans actually supported that ban. Nearly 50% of Americans, they admit that they feel prejudice towards Muslims and Islam. 25% of Americans agreed that Muslims should carry a special ID card in order to prevent further attacks in the future. And this is extremely alarming. Half of all Republicans believe that Islam is a violent religion. It's a religion that condones violence, encourages violence. This is very alarming to us respected brothers and sisters. But I'm not here to scare you. What is the solution of the religion of Islam? We have to know what the solution is and what our responsibilities are. How is it that we can play a positive role in calming down this nation? What is the solution of the religion of Islam when it comes to such issues? How do we stop a nation from becoming radicalized? From being influenced from such hateful rhetoric. And this is what's important. Because you know, the problem is not Donald Trump. He can say whatever he wants. The problem is the consequences of such hateful rhetoric. This is our society in which we live in. We cherish our homeland here. Here is the future of our children. We need to know what we need to do. So what is the solution of the religion of Islam? There are external factors and there are internal factors that the religion of Islam emphasizes, emphasizes in order to protect a nation from falling into such a trap, from becoming hateful, from becoming racist, and from becoming rejecting of other minorities of other groups. So let's start with the first internal factors. The first internal factor, brothers and sisters, something that the Holy Qur'an constantly stresses and emphasizes is what? Taqwa. To be pious. Because change starts in your heart. If I don't have piety in my heart, I can't change my society. I can't stop this hateful rhetoric. If I don't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm not God conscious. That's why you see the Holy Quran constantly emphasizing this. The best provision for you is to have piety, to be pious. Ya amanu Allah. O people, O you who believe, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be pious. The same verse mentions piety twice. Because when you're truly mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching you, watching your every move, everything you say, even how you think. That creates an internal barrier between you and between hatred, between you and racism, 
between you and arrogance and extremism. It all starts with taqwa. And piety doesn't mean that you have to have a beard and you go to the mosque and you pray in front of others. No, that's just one part of it. We've seen many people throughout history who used to pray. But what kind of prayer? A prayer which had no piety, a prayer which had no taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is monitoring our actions. Every minute of our actions is being monitored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know when you think about how many cameras are monitoring you from day to night, you'll change, you'll act very differently. First of all, Allah is watching you. Secondly, the angels of God, especially the two angels who are recording your actions. Number three, the very ground that you walk on is monitoring you. يَوْمَئِذٍ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا بِأَنَّ رَبَّكَ أَوْحَالَهَا Allah on the day of judgment will reveal to the earth to speak. What did I do on this land? What did I do on this earth? The prophets and the imams, they're monitoring our actions. Your own body parts are monitoring you. وَقَالُوا لِجُلُودِهِمْ لِمَا شَهِدْتُمْ عَلَيْنَا On the day of judgment, you will tell your skin, your body parts, why did you witness against me? Why did you expose me? What will it say? قَالُوا أَنْطَقَنَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي أَنْطَقَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who caused us to speak. If a person truly has taqwa, if, if a nation, if a society are pious, then you don't see such consequences. Even if someone comes with hateful rhetoric, you don't see millions of people changing within months, within weeks. This is the importance of piety. This is the importance of taqwa. They say once a father went with his son to a farmland to steal some fruits from that farmland. He told his son, my son, stand at the gate. Make sure no one is watching us. If you see someone watching us, I want you to let me know. Immediately point that out to me. So as soon as his father goes and he's about to pick those fruits and steal them, his son calls on him. His father comes back, you know, he's scared. Is there someone here? He told him, my dear son, what happened? He's like, well, someone's watching us. He came to the gates, he looked to his right, he looked to his left, no one was watching. He told him, my dear son, there's no one watching. So why did you call me and give me a false alarm? He told him, Baba, didn't you tell me that if someone's watching us, I should tell you? He's like, yeah, so who's watching us? He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching us. Just wanted to remind you of that. He had a good mother who raised him. You think if you raise your children like that, brothers and sisters, you'll have issues. If a person really grows up to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to truly have piety, would you have such issues? This is one internal solution that the Holy Quran gives us. That if you want Allah to change your status, you start changing yourself. This is number one. Number two is arrogance. Because a lot of these people who are supporting such hateful rhetoric, they're driven by arrogance. Because Trump and others, what do they tell them? Essentially, they're telling them, whether directly or indirectly, that we're better than all other nations. We're the best nation on earth. We're the best people. We're the most advanced people. We're this, we're this. And this actually creates a lot of arrogance. When you become arrogant, then yes, you'll hate others, you'll denounce others. You'll show your racism, you'll show your extremism. The Holy Quran teaches us to be humble. Why do you think the Holy Quran keeps telling us about the story of Prophet Adam السلام, and Iblis, the devil? Why does God keep telling us in so many of the chapters of the Quran? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, explains it to us. The Imam السلام, explains to us that the first sin that was ever committed was what? An act of arrogance. Because Iblis said, I will not prostrate to Adam. I'm better than him. You created me from fire and you created him from clay. And fire is surely better than clay. An act of arrogance. If we can teach humbleness to our families, to our societies, and spread that humbleness, this is a great way to stop this hatred, to stop racism, to truly feel humble. 
to truly feel that you're just a humble servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, once there was a gathering of two scholars in Najaf centuries ago. One of them was a very well-known scholar, he was a marja. And there was another one who was also a scholar, a marja, but not as famous as the first one. They got into an argument, an intellectual argument. He was trying to prove his point. The other one was trying to prove his point. Until one of the maraja, he remained silent. And it seemed that he accepted the argument of the other marja. Now, in that moment, people thought that the other marja, he became victorious. As that other marja was about to leave, you know what the first one did? He got up to him, he went to him, and as he was farewelling him, he kissed his hands. Do you know what that means? And he had a higher social status, yet he kissed his hands. Now his followers were, were really disturbed. Afterwards they came to him and they told him, what's going on? Why did you do that? Why did you kiss his hands? This is wrong. This is unacceptable. You know what he said? He said, when I was arguing with him and I realized that I had the proper argument, I became arrogant. I wanted to stop the arrogance. So I remained silent. Let him beat me in the conversation. So what? But then I felt myself struggling to prove myself, to prove my point, to be the victorious one. In order to tramp myself and restrain myself, I did the unthinkable. I went and I kissed his hand. So I teach myself a good lesson. Never act arrogantly. Never think you're better than others and you can win any argument. Arrogance. Arrogance breeds such type of hatred. Selfishness breeds subtype, subtype, such type of hatred. Unfortunately, many of you know, our fellow citizens, yes, we have the spirit of philanthropy, the spirit of generosity and giving, but many of us are selfish because we only care about us, ourselves, our problems. Who cares about what's happening in the world? Do you know that every year in the United States, $160 billion worth of fresh food is wasted. $160 billion. For those who have charitable organizations, you know what that means. You know that no human being will starve on earth if that $160 billion was spent on them. On the poor, to eradicate poverty, to eradic eradicate starvation and malnourishment. But the problem is we don't care. We're wasting all these resources. This goes back to selfishness because we really don't care. It's not important for us. And the third one is ignorance. Ignorance also breeds hatred. You know, interestingly, even you know, in the media they were coding this, that the diploma was the Republican fault line. Those, you know, a good indicator of those who would support such hateful rhetoric or they would support Trump is their level of education. Most of his supporters, they have less education, a high school diploma or less. Not all of them, but many of them. Because ignorance really breeds hatred. The more you're educated, the more you realize what's going on in the world. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instruct us in the Holy Quran? To see the diversity. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us that I've created you as nations and tribes? So you get to know one another. So you share experiences from one another. This is the beauty of the religion of Islam and the diversity that we see in the religion of Islam. So these are several internal factors. Now let's get to the external factors. One of the most important external factors, brothers and sisters, is for us as a community to speak up. We have to do something about this. And Imam al Hussein salam teaches us that when you see something wrong in your society, don't feel complacent. Don't feel powerless. No. Even if your numbers are a few, you can make a difference. No, America is not you know, going down the drain because of someone who's irresponsible. Like Donald Trump, no. America is still a great nation, 
But we have to play a role in keeping this nation a great nation. You can make a difference. If you think Imam al Hussein salam with 72 companions, he made a difference. On the other side, you had how many? 30,000. We're a lot more than 72. We're a lot more than 72. Just look at the numbers that we have in our community. We can make a difference. But we have to speak up. We have to have an active role in the media, in our communities, in our societies. And there are three groups, brothers and sisters, that we need to expose. Number one is ISIS. Because believe it or not, ISIS is now representing us in the eyes of millions of people. It could be your neighbor, believe me. Go to your neighbor, speak to your American neighbor, and you realize that, you know, Maybe ISIS does represent those people. Maybe if they're given power, they'll do the same. Millions of Americans are actually thinking that. What have you done to distance yourself from ISIS? What have you done? I want to ask all of you here tonight, brothers and sisters. Ask yourself, have I personally done anything to denounce extremism? Because it's extremists like ISIS who actually, you know, give people like Donald Trump the rhetoric to create hatred. That's what's dangerous. What have I done as an individual, as a citizen, to say that ISIS does not represent me, that I condemn this group? What have we done? We have to expose them. This is one group. The second group that we have to expose, brothers and sisters, are those who support ISIS. The Wahhabi ideology. Governments like Saudi Arabia who have backing, who has been backing such ideology for decades. For two centuries, they've been backing this Wahhabi ideology. This breeds violence, this breeds hatred. We have to expose them. And these days we're seeing a wave, you know, in the media of them being exposed. You know, the recent legislation passed, JASTA for example. And we see a lot of articles now in the New York Times and elsewhere. But this is the third group that we also need to expose brothers and sisters. And this is very sensitive, but we have to discuss this. You know, right now, for example, in the New York Times, we're seeing many articles that are speaking about Saudi Arabia and their role in terrorism, in supporting these terrorists. That's great, that's wonderful, and we should thank them for exposing that. But I would like to ask the New York Times and others, where were you the past 15 years when Saudi Arabia was supporting these terrorists? Was supporting the extremist Wahhabi ideology? Where were you? How come you were silent? All these politicians, these congressmen, suddenly now, they decide that Saudi Arabia should be held responsible. What happened the past 15 years? This should be a wake-up call for America, brothers and sisters. And we have to speak about this so this doesn't keep happening again. Politicians have to act responsibly. Yes, it's great right now that you begin to realize where the root of extremism is in the world. And who's feeding this extremist Wahhabi in the Muslim, this extremist ideology in the Muslim world. But what happened the last 15 years? How come you turned a blind eye? They have to be answerable to Americans. They need to explain their position the past several decades. So this doesn't happen again in the future. So we have to be very vocal, brothers and sisters. We have to speak up and defend our rights. We have to reject racism in all of its forms. It starts from us. You know, the problem is when you talk about racism with our fellow Americans, racism sometimes is destroying our own communities, our own societies. But listen to this hadith from the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Inspect your heart right now. See, do you have any traces of racism? Of prejudice? In this hadith, the Prophet peace be upon him says, مَنْ كَانَ فِي قَلْبِهِ حَبَّةُ خَرْدَلٍ مِنْ عَصَبِيَّةٍ if there is in your heart the size of a seed of racism, of prejudice, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect you 
with Arab al Jahiliya, with the pagans of Jahili. If you have the size of a seed of racism in your heart, a true believer is one who does not have racism. We need to lift the spirit of the religion of Islam and share it with our society, brothers and sisters. We Muslims should be at the forefront in combating, in combating racism, in combating hatred, prejudice, sexism. We should be at the forefront. But are we really doing our job? What are we doing in our societies? Let's learn from Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Let's take the spirit of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Let's say to our nation that such hateful rhetoric will not destroy us. With the spirit of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, we'll stop this hatred. We'll stop this racism. Let's show the love of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Through our actions, let's invite to the path of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. When others look at our actions, do really reflect the teachings of our Imams, of our leaders. You know, every company has a catalog. You look at the catalog, it's so nice and fancy. It really encourages you to buy the, to buy the product. We the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we are catalogs to the Imams. Because the people did not see the Imams. What do they see? They see me, they see you, they see us as a community. We are catalogs to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. We reflect their teachings. Have we been good catalogs, brothers and sisters? Through our actions, through our words, through our history, through our contributions, have we demonstrated to this society what Al Imam Al Hussein salam can offer? Ask yourself tonight, brothers and sisters, what can I do to change myself, first of all, and to change my society, and to give a good image of my faith, a real, genuine image of my faith. This is what the Imams expect of us. Imam al-Sadiq says, without your tongues, you don't need to even always speak through your actions. And especially the respected sisters. Allah is my witness when you're observing the hijab and you offer a good deed in your society, a charitable act, a act of humanity. Through your knowledge you dispel these misconceptions. This has such a great value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's take the flag of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam because the banner of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam invites everyone. Everyone is welcome to the path of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. You talk about racism, look what happened in Karbala. One of the companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam by the name of John, the son of Huwi or Huwai. This man was a slave owned by Abu Dhar. He was a black slave. He was with the Imam alayhi salam. He followed the Imam. He was in love with Abi Abdullah al Hussein. He could not leave the Imam for a single minute. When the Imam left Medina, he came with him. When he went to Mecca, he followed him. He followed him all the way to Karbala. The Imam alayhi salam told him, Oh John, you can leave. You joined us, you were with us, the Ahlul Bayt. So you can achieve security, stability, to achieve peace. But tomorrow is a very dangerous day. They shall attack us and they shall kill us. Leave, oh John. You know what he does? He falls at the feet of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. He tells him, Sayyidi, my master, in good times, I was with you. I would eat from your food. And now in difficult times, you want me to betray you? I won't betray you, O oh Abba Abdullah. On the day of Ashura, John comes to Abi Abdullah al Hussein. See the unifying message of the Imam. He welcomed everyone. And these are wonderful lessons, brothers and sisters, for us to combat racism. Especially in that society where people like John had absolutely no value. He came to the Imam alayhi salam to farewell the Imam. 
the Imam السلام, initially refused him permission to go out to the battlefield. But then the Imam السلام, he gave him the permission. He told him, Oh John, go and fight these enemies. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illuminate your face on the day of judgment. John goes out, he fights so valiantly. The love of Al Imam Al Hussein السلام, is driving him when the enemies they surround him from every direction. He falls to the ground. He calls on Al Imam Al Hussein, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. He calls on the Imam. The Imam السلام, rushes to him. The Imam السلام, sees him on the ground. Historians tell us the Imam did something unique with this black man that he only did with his only with his son Ali al Akbar. Historians say the Imam السلام, came down to the ground. He placed his cheek on the cheek of John, and he told him, "Oh John, may Allah forgive you. May Allah illuminate your face on the day of judgment." He begins to cry, "Man mithli wa ibn Rasulillah wa adhun khaddahu ala khaddi." He tells him, "Oh, Abu Abdullah Al Hussein, who's like me?" And the son, the grandson of Rasulullah, places his cheek on my cheek. But this is the message of Imam Al Hussein. He invited everyone. Zuhair ibn al Qayn, one of the companions of the Imam alayhi salam. He was a Uthmani, one of the supporters of Uthman. He was anti Ahl al Bayt. On the way to Karbala, the Imam alayhi salam met him and he heard the message of the Imam and he joined Al Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. This is one of the companions of the Imam. It was open to everyone. Another of the companions of Al Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was Wahab al Kalbi. Wahab was originally a Christian. When he heard the message of Imam al Hussein السلام, he embraced the message of Imam al Hussein. On the day of Ashura, the mother of Wahab told him, My dear son Wahab, what are you waiting for? Don't you want to illuminate my face before Fatima al Zahra on the day of judgment? I shall not be satisfied with you unless you go and fight alongside Imam al Hussein and be killed in his way. But you know, Wahab, he had recently gotten married. Maybe just two months before that, he was a new, newlywed man. His wife was very disturbed. She told him, Oh Wahab, I beg you, don't leave me. We just got married. Let's share our lives together. Let's enjoy our life together. I can't see you go and getting killed in front of you. She, she keeps begging him not to go. But his mother keeps pushing him. She tells him, Oh Wahab, I shall not be satisfied unless you go and you die with the companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Wahab, he farewells them, he goes and he defends the Imam alayhi salam. When he was in the battlefield in his final moments, he heard a voice coming from behind him. Ya Wahab, qatil duna tayyibin. He heard someone, a familiar voice telling him, Oh Wahab, yes, continue fighting, continue fight. Defend the righteous people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He turns his face, he sees his wife coming, he's puzzled, he's confused. He tells her, my dear wife, just moments ago, you were trying to stop me from defending Hussein. What happened now? I see you encouraging me. She tells him, oh Wahab, do not blame me. I saw a scene that broke my heart. I saw Abu Abdullah al Hussein standing by the tents, feeling so lonely. In Nawa'iyat al Hussein, kasarat qalbi. He tells her, What? What was Hussein saying? What is it that he said that changed your position? I saw this lonely man. He said, Allah, hal min nasrin yansuruni. Is there anyone to support us? Is there anyone to support these women and children? O oh, Wahab, go and fight and die in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Everyone together, let's pay our salutations to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and companions. Assalamu ala al Hussein wa ala Ali ibn al Hussein 
وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته